It's Reality Check with Craig Price. I'm an idiot. Four minutes in and I'm already wrong. I'm like a monkey. Hello, look at me. Craig, shut up. Hey, I need you guys to do these things. (laughs) You're like a beautiful mind. I'm more like Forrest Gump. So it's, (laughs) it's Reality Check with Craig Price. This week, Christina Hamlet talks about ghostwriting. Thanks for downloading the show. You know, writing a book can be intimidating. It's it's more psychological than anything because even I've written a book. But sometimes due to our schedule, maybe it's our own lack of writing ability. Maybe it's just a lack of real desire to sit down and write it and take all that time up. Many people hire ghostwriters to finish the book everyone seems to have in them. And maybe you thought about using a ghostwriter yourself, but you're not sure how to do it or what's really involved. Well, today's guest will help you decide if a ghostwriter is the right path for you to follow. But before we talk to Christina, a quick friendly reminder that the 100th episode is coming up and I want you to be part of it. Simply call 281-668-8948. Again, that's 281-668-8948 and leave a message. If you're a new listener or a longtime supporter or even a past guest, I'd love to hear from you and make you a part of the 100th episode. So please call in. I've gotten some great messages already, and I really hope that you take the time out. Let us know where you're from, what you think of the show, what you think of me. Hopefully, it's all good stuff, but I, I hope you call in. Also, a quick reminder, you can find the show on Twitter, at RealityCheckPod, and at the website, www, say that real quick, fast again, www.RealityCheckPodcast.com. You can subscribe to the weekly newsletter that's there, and it lets you know who's on the show, upcoming guests, and even more. Finally, some cross-promotion. I was on past guest David Newman's Do It Marketing Podcast last week uh, talking about using podcasts to promote meetings and events. So if you go to doitmarketing.com and go to his blog, or you can go to iTunes and just do a search for Do It Marketing Podcast with David Newman, you'll see that I'm there and talking about podcasts. And I'll be guesting on several people's podcasts in the future. And so at some point, I'll create a page on the Reality Check Podcast website that links to these other guest appearances uh, in case you're interested. Some of you are, some of you are not, but I want to give you the option. There, the marketing's out of the way, so let's pull out our Ouija boards and start ghostwriting with Christina Hamlet. Ghostwriting seems to be something that only the rich and famous get to do. And it's really funny because a lot of people go, oh, Craig, you've written a book. You must be really smart. And then I tell them that, you know, Paris Hilton has written a book and Snooki has written a book. Um, So you don't necessarily need to be rich and famous to write a book, but you also don't need to be rich and famous to ghostwrite a book. Explain exactly what a ghostwriter does, does, because I'm not sure a lot of people know exactly Okay, well, first of all, let me explain. Being a ghostwriter has nothing to do with seances and talking to dead people. You'd be surprised how many people think that's what a ghostwriter does. A ghostwriter is the silent writing partner of anyone who wants to write a novel, their memoirs, a stage play, a screenplay, or even bloggers and newspaper columnists. And these are people who either don't have the time or don't have the skill set or the focus to develop and write these projects themselves. And so they want to hire someone who has a lot of experience with whatever subject area they want to write about. And it's kind of like hiring someone to do your homework for you. They pay the ghostwriter to do the work. And then their own name appears on the project. It's as if they wrote the whole thing themselves. So, I mean, it's hard to sometimes to put your own voice on paper. Uh, having written a book, I know how difficult it was just to make the book sound like me. Uh, how is it possible and what do you do when you talk to your p- potential clients about getting their voice not on paper but through you onto paper? So they've got a, there's an extra step involved. Yes. Ghostwriters are very much chameleons. If you are hired to write someone else's book, that book should kind of sort of somewhat sound like the person actually wrote it. And in order to capture that, I have a lot of 
phone conversations with my clients. We exchange a lot of emails. They send me samples of their writing so that I get a sense of what is their view of the world and of this story? How do they organize and present their thoughts? So I spend enough time with them on the phone and via email, sometimes even in person, to get a sense of who they are and how they are as communicators so that I can be them, but a better and more articulate them. And my guest today is Christina Hamlet. You have written 30 books, 152 stage uh, plays. Books. Did you yep. say three? I said 30. 30. Three, ah, three zero. Yes, 30. <laughs> yes. <laughs> no, I, I, I have, I, I think I have, I have cousins that aren't very bright who've written three books, but you've written thirty books, 152 stage plays, five option feature films. Um, you not only are a professional ghostwriter, but you're a writer under your own name as well. And I was going to ask you how you do that transition. How did you personally do that transition from? I'm a writer. I write, I write a lot of things under the name Christina Hamlet. Now I'm going to start writing for someone else. Mm -hmm. Well, people have read my articles and interviews. They've asked for me to mentor them with their writing. I think everyone feels, I have a book inside of me. I really want to do this. But they don't know where to start and how to do it. And it began with people saying, could you edit something that I've written? Give me some pointers on how I can make it better. And because of my expertise and my reputation as a writer and an editor, they began to ask me if they could pay me to do bigger projects, if they could refer their friends and their colleagues to me, and a lot of it was referral. I am also associated with Indra PR, which is a public relations firm in New York. It primarily has a clientele of celebrities, of pro athletes, and musicians, and actors, and models. And so I am the remote ghostwriter. I live in California, but I get referrals from Indra PR in New York, which is a lot of fun. In this day and age, you can literally live anywhere on the planet, and if you have an internet connection, you can almost do any job. You know, Definitely. So what... A lot of, like I said, you, you did started doing some editing, but ghostwriters aren't necessarily editors. And then you don't put your name on the on the cover, so you're not necessarily a collaborator because collaborator, sometimes someone big will write a book and it will say, Charles Barkley with somebody. Mm -hmm. uh, but a pure ghostwriter is, I'm going to write this. I'm not going to get recognition except you're going to pay me. That's the, right. so. So explain the differences between a ghostwriter, a collaborator, and an editor because do you do all three? three of those things, or do you just, you know, just do the ghost writing? Well, let me explain, uh, giving a seafaring analogy of what these three different areas of expertise are. Uh, let's say that you have your heart set on an exciting destination that we will call the land of publishing. Uh, but you don't know how to build a boat, and you've never been to sea. You just know you really want to go to the land of publishing. And what you need is someone who has done both of these things. And so you pay them to build your boat, give you navigational tips, warn you about all the sea monsters out, out there, and they allow you to take all the credit for the successful journey. And that's what a ghostwriter does. Now, a collaborator is a kindred spirit who wants to take a voyage with you. And so you bring your respective skill sets to the table. You're going to build that boat together, chart your course, and split whatever treasures you come across along the way or at your final destination. The downside of this is that in a 24 seven partnership, it can really breed contempt, and at the halfway point, you may want to drown each other. So that's what a collaborator does. A collaborator, both of the participants take all of the risks, reap all of the rewards, and they both have their names on the final product. The third category is, let's say you built a boat all by yourself, and you just want it to look as pretty as possible. So you want to hire a painter, or in this case, an editor. 
And at one end of the spectrum are the really bad editors, and they'll slather great gobs of paint on a vessel that isn't seaworthy, and 20 feet out of the harbor with your prettily painted boat, you will sink. Uh, At the other end are those who have actual experience with boat construction, and They'll not only recognize where all the holes are in your boat, but they'll also ask you whether you really want to invest in a paint job that's not going to get you where you want to go. Now, I do all three of these things, ghostwriting, collaborating, and editing. However, I want to make it really clear that I only collaborate with personal colleagues of mine, and that's in the field of playwriting. And you would be surprised how many people write to me. They, they don't understand the difference with ghostwriters, collaborators, and editors. And they'll say, oh, Christina, I have this great idea for a book in my head. So I'll give you the idea, and you write the whole thing for me, and you go sell it, and then we'll split everything 50-50. What do you think? And I'll say, I don't really don't think that's a very good idea. Why don't you write the whole thing yourself, keep all the profits, and go away? Because why would I why would I want to collaborate with someone I have never heard of who is saying you do all the work and I'll split half the money with you? Now that's not how it works. Yeah, and, and oftentimes everyone comes up with this great idea that's actually uh, one of duplicate of a hundred other ideas that are already out there and have done already have done better. Uh, mm-hmm. Like like I was going to say, walk me through the process. Pretend I am a CEO of a major company, and uh, now if I'm a CEO, that means I have to be – I have to have a book. I have to have a book telling my, you know, my strategy, how I do things. And so let me find – how am I going to find a ghostwriter to help take my mediocre uh, strategy that everyone does? And make it amazing. So is there a way to find ghostwriters? I mean, I know you in particular we can find through websites and stuff. But, I mean, in, in general, you can't take on every assignment. If I'm, if, <laughs> if I'm looking for somebody, how can someone look for a ghostwriter and then start working on them? Okay. A lot of them use resources um, such as help a reporter out. They use Craigslist. Reporter connection is no longer around. It it ceased publication a couple of weeks ago. But they will put out ads through media channels, and they'll say, looking for a ghostwriter to write my fabulous How I Did It CEO book. And they will be inundated with resumes and letters from people who either have a lot of experience or they just think, wow, ghostwriting, that must pay a lot, that's cool, I think I'll respond, and they have no clue what they're doing. They will also find ghostwriters through referrals of other executives, for instance, that they know wrote a book, and they suspect, you really didn't write that book. Between you and me, did you have a ghostwriter? Was that person good? Who was it? Can you hook me up? They will also look at books that are written by people that they suspect could not write their own book and hired someone. And a lot of times clients, as a way to thank the ghostwriter, will put something in the introduction saying, and with special thanks to my editor so-and-so. That special thanks to my editor, it could be a real editor or that could just be their way of publicly thanking their ghostwriter without admitting that they hired a ghostwriter. So they're they're looking very carefully at the intros in those books or, for instance, memoirs where it says the so-and-so story, as told to. As told to is another trigger that uh, this is someone who is an excellent editor and perhaps took on some ghostwriting things, but the client insisted on putting their name out there. So those are just little ways you can find out if something is ghostwritten and what resources you can use to go find your own ghostwriter. Now, the, when when you start piecing it together, you start you interview the person to find out if they're fit because. I, I would imagine you don't take on every single person that, that knocks on your door saying, hey, I need a ghostwriter. You want uh, to find... Definitely not. There, there are lots of idiots out there. They're well-meaning idiots, but 
they are trying to do something that has been done to death, they're very unfocused, or in the case of people writing memoirs, they believe that a memoir is a good way to get revenge on anyone who has ever wronged them, and they want to hire a ghostwriter to do the tell-all story so that they will feel better about themselves. So then you end up being a therapist most of the time instead of a writer. No, I say, what is your end game in this? Who is your target market for this book? What do you really want to accomplish in it? And there are a number of people who have not thought that through. They want to write a book, but they don't know who is this going to appeal to? What will it accomplish? Do I even have a unique voice? Why am I wasting my time and the time of the ghostwriter? So I I want them to seriously consider these things, whether they're going to hire me or anyone else. You need to know what your purpose is and your focus, or it's just not going to work. And also if there's a, an audience, because there's a, there's a new way, there's a lot more self-publishing going on, and people don't understand – what exactly self-publishing entails because they think, well, if I, if I go the regular route through, let's, we'll just say Wiley or Penguin or Random House, mis- this is not true, but they think in their heads, they'll take care of everything. I'll write the book and then they'll take care of everything. Mm-hmm. Which is, and so in self-publishing, there's, a lot, there's even more to it because all that stuff that they think the, the big publishers are going to do, they're going to have to do as well. Market, uh, you know, find distributors and things like that. So why? But it seems easier now with Kindle. So is self-publishing, which is on the rise, how, why is it such a, a more popular and accessible format? Well, there are a number of things, Craig. The first is that assumption the big publishing house will take care of you is not true. Big publishing houses have downsized considerably. They've laid off their marketing staff because it's cheaper to outsource marketing and public relations tasks to people that you don't have to give desk to or provide health insurance. So they're trimming down their expenses. Many major publishers will not even offer you a contract unless you have demonstrated you have a full-fledged marketing plan and a platform and you are going to get out there and do all the work yourself. If you have to do all of the work yourself, why would you not want to reap more of the profits of that? Most people are not aware the average royalty paid by traditional publishers is 8 to 12%. With self-publishing, such as through Kindle, which is an excellent program, you could be getting as much as 70%. It's the same work, the same book. You did everything. Wouldn't you rather have 70%? There's also the question of immediacy. If you are an unknown writer, but woohoo, you sign your first contract for your work of fiction, it will likely be 18 to 24 months from the time the contract is signed to when your book actually gets out there on the market. We are a very impatient right now society. If you are writing something in a nonfiction field, especially technology, 18 to 24 months from now, a lot of what you are hyping in your book will already be obsolete. In contrast, in self-publishing, you could get something out in less than two weeks and have it on Amazon and start selling it. There's also the final issue of shelf life on bookstores. Uh, If you are a new writer, unless your book takes off like hotcakes and becomes an overnight bestseller, The average shelf life of a new book by an unknown author is two to six weeks at your local Barnes & Noble. They have to then get the books out because they have new books by unknown authors and by best-selling authors, and they have a finite amount of space. So if your book hasn't proven itself in two to six weeks in a brick-and-mortar store, it's out of there. Self-publishing, your book can live in that little virtual bookstore as long as the Internet continues to exist. So if when you're looking at clients, I'm sure you've worked with some that have been difficult where as soon as they've hired the ghostwriter, they were like on you 24 hours a day, seven days a week, really writing the book by whispering in your ear and annoying you where you're like, so what kind of mindset do you would, would you like 
the client to get into and, and what kind of mindset should a client get into as far as control and, and input when they start talking to the ghostwriter? Okay, uh, I can tell a lot about a prospective client from that first 30-minute consultation phone call. If they're interrupting me a lot and saying, oh, okay, but I want to do it this way and I want to do it that way, I'm thinking, this is going to be an annoying client. They're going to be constantly, what are you doing? Why are you doing it that way? Well, I want to do it this way. Blah, 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 blah. A good client for a ghostwriter is one who knows what they don't know they respect the craft of the ghostwriter, and they want to participate in the process, whether it's taking the germ of an idea into a full-fledged book, or they need a lot of help fixing a book that they started and realized was not going to work at all. So I want them involved in the process. I want them to ask a lot of questions. If they don't know something, Oh, why are we doing it this way, Christina? Well, we are doing it this way because da 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 da. Okay, well, thank you. Many of my clients, after working with me, evolve into much better writers themselves because they have been a part of the process all along and ask questions and I, I task them with going off and doing research. And this is your assignment for this week. Come back with me. Let's talk about what you discovered, what you learned. A bad client is one who has expectations of, well, as soon as you write my book, I can quit my drecky day job and ride around in limos and be on Letterman and I'm going to be an overnight success. They don't want to hear the realities of today's publishing industry. They don't want to invest in their own marketing plan and establish themselves as, as an expert. They just think by signing a contract with a ghostwriter, it's like taking a magic pill for overnight success, that I'll do all the work for them and bada bing, da da, I'm successful. It doesn't happen that way. And I am very upfront with clients through the whole process. This is what you can expect to happen. These are the realities of the industry. This is what you can do to make yourself a more marketable commodity. But as far as the writing and the structure, why are you paying me all of this money and then telling me how I should write every single sentence? So you mean they don't want to hear how they may end up being in a town they've never been in, where they don't have any friends or family that they can rely on to generate publicity, and then they end up being what I call the Sam's Club vendor, where they have to stand by their books and talk to people as they walk by, trying to get them to buy their book, which I, I have been mm -hmm. participated in myself. I've had the sell out, everybody's there to hear you, you do a little presentation, and, and uh, you know, then all you do is sit down and sign and talk to people, which is the best kind of book, book signing. Versus the, yeah, I'm giving out hot dog samples in the corner of the Sam's Club or the Costco or the grocery store as people walk by, hoping they'll give me the time of day to talk, to to take my book and sell it. Right. It's, they think it's a super glamorous life. So, so if, if, when you think about your clients, would you prefer a client approach you with an idea and an outline, or an, a full fledged manuscript, or just with, from scratch so you can start, you know, fresh? How would you prefer someone to show up? Okay. Uh, I, I work with clients along the full spectrum of an idea in their head to people who wrote their 40,000-word novel and everyone said, well, that's really nice, but, you know, it's really not very good. I, I think you need some help on this. Uh, I had a gentleman who wanted to write romance novels and he couldn't figure out why publishers were rejecting his manuscript. And I said, could it possibly be that the heroine of your romance novel is a hooker in Las Vegas? You, you haven't read romance novels to understand. That's something you don't do. <laughs> so, you know, they needed a lot of help in, in what are publishers looking for. They have to have an idea that they have put enough thought into and believe that there is a strong market for it for me to want to work with them. Um, if they say, I want to write a book about pandas because I think they're cute. And I'll say, okay, great. What about them? Oh, well, I don't know. You're the ghostwriter. Don't you just go think of all that for me? 
Well, no. Is it going to be nonfiction? Fiction. Uh, is it going to be talking pandas? Is it going to be research on pandas? Uh, yes, you love pandas, but that's not enough. You need to give me more of a sense of why pandas are important enough you want to pay me to write about them. And with the books that I fix, it's a mix of editing what they have done that that is right and, and has a good foundation and ghostwriting all of the parts that are weak and are a detriment to the story if they haven't fully fleshed out their characters or if their dialogue is really lame or they have holes in the plot that you could drive semis through. So again, Craig, it is all levels and I can't say I have a preference of one or the other because it really depends on whether it's nonfiction or fiction and the genre. And if I feel there's really a message there that gets me excited because I'm going to be spending a lot of time with this person and I want to write about something that I really believe in and that excites me. Well, our, our last question is, is kind of a heavy question. It, can, it comes from the Internet and in on. And in honor of ghostwriting, I'm not going to give this person any credit. Um, I'm just going to say, pretend it's my question. Um, they ask, are there morality questions around ghostwriting and autobiography for someone? So basically, people walking around going, I've written this wonderful book, when in fact, they've told a couple stories to you, and you have written a wonderful book. So where do you, where do you, where where does your perspective on, on ethics and morality as far as, you know, who really takes credit for it, and, and, and have you really written a book if you get a ghostwriter? Yes, you have really written a book if you've hired a ghostwriter, because it was your idea, your vision, you paid the money to the ghostwriter, you are putting your name on it, and as far as you know, ethical issues and morality and this gets back to the question of people who want to write an autobiography and pump themselves up with things that didn't really happen, like if, for instance, they said they, they invented the Internet, uh, or if they are only using this as a platform to slander and trash someone else. During that consultation, I find out, what's your end game? Why are you doing this? Have you thought about the legal consequences of if you slander someone in your book? I am writing the book for you from the understanding that you are telling me the truth. If you are not telling me the truth and you get sued, it was your name on the book. And you told me everything was, was absolutely true in it. You're taking all the credit for it. That is what absolves a ghostwriter from also being sued for saying things because in the contractual relationship, it's a good faith relationship that what the client is telling you to the best of their knowledge, that's the way it happened. And whatever happens from there with them, theirs is the name that is on it because, yes, they have written a book. They paid money. They put their name on it. It is their book for all intents and purposes. And what I like to tell people, it's really a translation. Yeah, it's a book. What you, what you did is translate their verbal story or their emails or their notes to you into a coherent frame of thought. So I, I completely agree that it's, it's a book. I just wanted to throw that out there because that was someone's, someone's <laughs> very good question. Uh, anytime I get questions from the Internet, I, I try to include them. Uh, so if someone wants to hire you to ghostwrite their wonderful, great new idea that is fully formed and ready to go, uh -huh. where, where can people find you? Okay, they can contact me through my website, which is www.authorhamlet.com, and that's A-U-T-H-O-R-H-A-M, as in Mary, L-E-T-T -T dot and if they can't remember that, all they have to do is type in Christina with a C, Hamlet with two T's into their search engine, 
given the volume of articles and interviews and books and things I'm doing, I pop up in squillions of places all over the Internet, and most of my articles carry a tagline with a link to my website. So it's as easy as possible for them to find me and, and ask me stuff. Well, I certainly appreciate you allowing me to ask you stuff today. Thanks for being on the show. Oh, it was fun, Craig. Thanks for having me. That's our show for this week. Again, thanks to Christina Hamlet for coming on the show. I hope this gave you the tools or at least the encouragement to get out and get your own book started, whether you write it or a ghostwriter does it. Remember, we're on iTunes, so leave a review or at least click five stars while you're there. It certainly would help. Like the show on Facebook or on Google+. Yes, we're everywhere. We even have a channel on YouTube. No show next week as we celebrate the 4th of July, but thanks for listening. 